The problem is nowadays, uh, the more stuff my name is attached to, the more likely it is that somebody's going to try to do some kind of stupid freaking TV special or, you know, you know how it is nowadays, like with all this true crime bullshit that people are obsessed with. Hey guys, my name is Brooke and I enjoy reading about strange occurrences, true crime, conspiracy theories, etc. and sharing my findings with like-minded and curious individuals. If you feel that you fit that description, please consider hitting the subscribe button down below. In today's case, we will be covering one of the most disturbing criminals that North America has had the displeasure of experiencing, Israel Keys. From murder to assault to burglary to arson, Israel Key pretty much checks all of the crazy boxes. This topic was actually recommended to me by one of my lovely viewers in my last video, and you too can leave a comment down below giving any type of suggestion on a topic you'd like me to cover, and I will get to it as soon as I can. We've got a lot to cover today, so without further ado, let's jump right into today's case. Israel Keys was born in Richmond, Utah on January 7th, 1978, to parents Heidi and Jeff Keys. Heidi and Jeff were originally of the Mormon faith, and although Israel was only their second child, their religious ideology would lead them to have an additional eight children over the next several years. In 1983, when Israel was only five years old, his parents decided that they really didn't want to be Mormons anymore and they would convert to what I would call Christian fundamentalism to the extreme. In addition to this, both Heidi and Jeff shared a pretty strong distaste for anything related to authority figures such as the government, modern medicine, public school systems, Systems, and because of this, they chose to homeschool all of their children. On one occasion, neighbors noticed that although the Keys family were pretty large and they had a lot of kids, they never really saw them go outside of their house. And because they wanted to make sure that everything was okay, they contacted CPS. When authorities arrived at the Keys residence, Heidi and Jeff were none too pleased with this, and they didn't like how people were peeking into their little lifestyle that they were living and not minding their own business. So with their anarchic beliefs and their new family, extreme religion, Heidi and Jeff would relocate their family away from Utah and to a very remote plot of land in Colville, Washington. Now this plot of land only had a very small cabin on it which had one singular room meant to house all of these people, these 12 members of the Keys family, which is just a little crazy to me because imagine the lack of privacy. Now not only was the Keys family off of the societal grid, but they were literally off of the grid too. They had no electricity, no water, they were out there just buffing it. As Heidi and Jeff worked on uh, growing the family, they needed a lot more privacy and this led them to buying tents where they would make their older children just sleep outside. There wasn't enough room in this one room cabin for all these kids so that's what they decided to do. The Keys family was really confined to the outskirts of society at the direction of the parents of course. So the family practiced collecting their own food, hunting, cutting down campfire, building their own shelter her things like that. Occasionally, when they really needed money, they would send their kids to work on other local farms just to rake in a little bit of cash and meet their needs. One aspect of their lives that did allow them to incorporate themselves into society was their religion. In order to attend church services, the Keys family would travel to nearby Colville, where they became members of a church called the Ark. Now, the Ark preached Christian identity, and if you're anything like me and have never heard this before, let me just give you a brief little run down. It's not exactly an organized religion, but it is a sect of the religion that preaches that basically white people are going to heaven and anybody who's not white is going to heaven, but they're going to be exterminated or enslaved under the white people. They're basically just white supremacists that use their religion as a veil to cover their racial bigotry and it's pretty gross. In addition to attending the Ark, the Keys family also frequented the Christian Israel Covenant Church, which also reveled in the teachings of white supremacy. Even though the Keys family was surrounded by basically a sounding board for their hateful ideology and received no pushback since they were so far removed from society, um, Israel still managed to find a way to be disliked by this community. He developed into the type of teenager that his peers actively avoided. One girl who attended these churches that the Keys family frequented described Israel as the type of person that made her skin crawl, and I think that's saying a lot considering the 
type of people that we're talking about right now. In his free time, Israel enjoyed lighting fires in the woods as well as shooting BBs at and breaking into local houses. By the age of 14, Israel was breaking into people's houses, stealing their firearms, and selling them to other adults within the community. While it wasn't uncommon for these rural folks to hunt for both food and sport, Israel took it to a whole other level. In his free time, Israel would hunt basically anything that crossed his path and had a heartbeat, and on one occasion he even went to church and bragged to his peers that he had skinned a live deer. On another occasion, he gathered some family friends and family members and he tied a cat to a tree where he then tortured it by shooting it in the stomach and watching it squirm around until it died. And one of the kids that was there to witness it started vomiting and Israel was really confused. He started laughing at first, but this was kind of the first indication where he realized he wasn't like everybody else. He originally had thought everybody had these dark thoughts deep in their minds, but they just weren't expressing it the same way that he was. It was only after this incident that Israel started to do some self-reflection and unlike you and I would probably hope it was not for the best. He realized that he was in fact different from his peers but instead of you know stopping these abnormal behaviors and rerouting reevaluating his life he decided to just start doing them secretly. Instead of bragging about his newest cruel endeavors he would keep these things to himself and keep it pushing. He even ended up using his homesteading skills to build his own cabin on his family's property where he lived alone separate from his siblings and his parents. Israel's mother did take notice of his changed behavior and said he was doing concerning things like listening to the radio. Now I'm not sure exactly what kind of radio stations Israel was listening to, likely some like secular music that his family didn't agree with, but I think it's just funny that this is what tipped his mother off. It wasn't the fact that he was torturing animals and bragging about it, it was the fact that he was listening to mainstream music that she didn't agree with. Anyways, moving on. In the late 90s, the Keys children were growing into their teen years where a lot of people start to disagree with their parents and they really had to go to the extreme to do things such as watch movies with their friends or go out on dates or anything that a normal teenager would do. It was around this time that Israel got into a pretty big argument with his parents because he disagreed with their way of life and he didn't want to do it anymore. This is actually where a pretty big flip switched for Israel because he claims later on that his belief in God was the one thing that was kind of keeping him from taking his abnormal behaviors to the next level and go even further to start murdering people rather than just animals. Once he no longer believed in the singular aspect that kept him from committing these terrible crimes, he had nothing holding him back. Now knowing that their eldest son is an atheist, Jeff and Heidi were absolutely having none of this blasphemy under their roof and they immediately kicked him out, instructing his siblings to not communicate with him ever again. So with this, sometime between 1997 and 1998, Israel Keys figured that he wanted to delve into this new lifestyle that he had unlocked for himself. So he took a trip to the Descartes River in Oregon and stood out in the tree line waiting for his first victim. It was when Israel saw a group of girls floating down the river in some inner tubes that he decided this would be his time. He noticed one girl was a little bit farther behind the group than the rest of her friends and he decided to take this opportunity to walk down to the river line, pick this girl up out of her inner tube and take her to a nearby public restroom where he would proceed to sexually assault her. This girl is only about 14 years old, but that doesn't stop her from having some survival skills and some common sense to know that she needs to do whatever it takes to get out of this situation. So she begins telling Israel that he's an attractive guy and you know, if they weren't in this situation and she just saw him, she would probably date him and he wouldn't need to do this in order to get with her. Israel had originally planned to take the young girl's life after he had assaulted her in the bathroom, but the young girl's tactic actually ended up working. He let the young girl go back to her group of friends and I'm assuming she never ended up telling anybody about this, unfortunately. I mean, it was a very traumatic event, but Israel was never caught. Fast forward a few months and Israel makes the decision to enlist into the United States Army, partially to kind of rebel against his parents' very anarchic beliefs. 
beliefs and also because he was just kind of short on money and he needed some sort of career. During his three years of service with the army, Israel managed to make a few friends who noted the fact that he was pretty quiet and shy. He kept to himself and in his free time, he would stay in his barracks room, drink his favorite bottle of whiskey and listen to his favorite band, Insane Clown Posse. For those unfamiliar with ICP, they are a horrorcore rap group whose fan base they refer to as Juggalos. Juggalos are often characterized by their evil clown makeup, their hatchet man gear, and their love for the beverage Fago. ICP's music mainly revolves around themes such as violence and cannibalism, while at times having political undertones and opposing things such as racism, child abuse, and domestic violence. As of 2011, the FBI has actually classified Juggalos as a gang due to their many gang-related activities, but as with anything, there's usually two sides, and there is one side of the Juggalos who do a lot of community work, such as charities, volunteers. Many people decide to become Juggalos because of their music's underlying message that regardless of if you don't fit in with your community or you don't feel like you belong, you can always come to fellow Juggalos and really have a sense of family and community. I feel like this is likely what led Israel to become one of their fans because he really hadn't fit in anywhere for quite a long time. Along with that, he also probably liked the music about killing people and eating people and, you know, all of those really weird things. Who am I to judge, you know? I'm judging a little bit, but... After three years in the army, Israel would be honorably discharged because the only trouble that he'd managed to get himself in during these three years was getting a DUI. And while that's not great, it's fairly tame compared to what he goes on to commit, unfortunately. While he didn't get caught committing any violent crimes during his time in the army, he did later reveal that while deployed overseas to Egypt, he did assault two foreign women. At his final duty station in Washington, Israel had met a young woman named Tammy who was a part of the Macaw tribe and he decided to move to the Macaw's reservation in order to live with her and start a life. In October of 2001, Tammy and Israel would welcome their daughter into the world who is known as Sarah for the sake of anonymity. I don't know what her real name is and I don't think it matters. I don't think anyone needs to know that. Surprisingly, Israel was actually a very good father to his daughter and his community just generally saw him as a really hard worker and a great family man, but little did the residents of Nea Bay know that Israel was living a secret double life as a serial killer. It was actually in this community where it is believed that Israel committed his first murder. In Nea Bay, Washington, Israel had actually secured a job as a park ranger, which he used to his advantage by hiking, fishing, and, you know, just scoping out the local woods in search of places to hide bodies. Now, if there's one thing that Israel is going to make sure of, it's that he does his research. He'd heard about all of these infamous serial killers before, and while he did sort of admire them, he wanted to know what they had done in order to get themselves caught so that he could avoid meeting the same fate. He wanted to make sure that no page was left unturned when it came to the measures he needed to take in order to avoid detection. First and foremost, Israel made sure to pay for everything he did in cash as well as keep his phone off at pretty much all times with the battery removed. Israel found that one of the biggest mistakes that serial killers typically made was to create a sort of modus operandi where they could very well get caught because they were repeating the same actions over and over again and creating a pattern for police to follow. Israel wanted his murders to be as random as possible to avoid getting caught. He never murdered in the same place and he never had a specific type of victim that he would choose, regardless of a person's race, sex, gender, weight, you could very well become a victim if you happened to cross his path. His one exception to this rule was that ever since he had had a daughter, he didn't want to murder children and he didn't want to murder any parents that had children because somewhere in his deep, dark heart, he had a little bit of a soft spot. However, the FBI believes that this probably isn't true and he was probably just picking off people left and right regardless of their age. Israel would simply pick where and how he wanted to commit a crime. He would go to that area and just wait for whoever came along. He even claimed to have this sort of sixth sense where he could tell if people would be missed or not, which I don't know how you can determine that, but 
go off. While not much information has been revealed about Israel's first murder, a body was recovered and the death was ruled accidental because at the time, police didn't know what happened to this person. In a later interrogation, however, Israel would hint at the fact that he did kill somebody and he did make it look like an accident in this area. Tammy would later tell police that around this time, a very close neighbor of theirs had gone missing after going on a hike and Israel just so happened to not be home that night, but she just kind of figured he was doing something like cheating, you know, not murdering people. From late 2001 to 2006, there were several murders and disappearances that took place within the Pacific Northwest that have now been determined to probably be linked to Israel Keys. There isn't a ton of information about these individual cases and whether or not Israel is or isn't connected, they are still missing people and just for that reason, simply I want to put their names and faces out there and just give you a brief rundown as to who these people were. So on November 21st, 2001, 16-year-old Cami Volendroff and her 18-year-old boyfriend Eugene Hyatt were last seen going down to the Oregon coast to look at some tide pools when they would unfortunately never be seen again. Israel did admit to murdering a young couple around this time, but seeing as Cami and Eugene's bodies were never recovered and Israel never said who these people were, it cannot be confirmed that he was responsible for the young couple's deaths. In August of 2004, a woman named Alice Looney went missing from her Washington State apartment, and three months later, her body was found in a wooded area. In October 2004, in Portland, Oregon, Kimberly Forbes was said to have planned to go get breakfast and go shopping with a friend the following morning, but unfortunately, she would never make it to those plans. Three weeks later, her car was found 50 miles away from her home with the back windshield broken out. In March 2004, a man named Delmar Staples was said to have gone on a solo hike to Tillamook, Oregon, but unfortunately only two days later, his car was found 200 miles away from Tillamook, Oregon, just abandoned near a lakeside. In April 2005, Wendy DeHoop went missing after dropping her husband off at work that morning. Ten days later, her car was found abandoned in a wooded area in southern Eugene, Oregon. In June 2006, Steve Mason disappeared appeared from his campsite near Squim, Washington after getting into an argument with his wife, but unlike the other individuals that I've just mentioned, Steve did work at the local VFW where Israel was actually a member, so this was a solid connection. Around 2007-ish, Tammy began having a bit of a problem with substance addiction, and Israel just decided that he didn't want to be around this anymore, so he made the decision to end the relationship with Tammy and take full custody of their daughter. Sarah. Only a few months later, Israel would start dating a woman named Kimberly, and he and Kimberly and his daughter would all relocate to Anchorage, Alaska only a few months later. In Anchorage, Israel opened up his own construction business called Keys Construction, and once again, this community was very accepting of him. They saw him as a hardworking family man and had no idea what was going on behind the scenes. It was during this time where Israel began traveling to the lower states of the continent U.S. in order to spread out the locations of his many, many crimes. He told his loved ones that when he was going on these trips, he was just going to do really mundane things like visit family members or go run marathons. You know, they had no idea, no suspicion what he was really doing. He would take various methods of transportation, such as plane, trains, and automobiles in order to get to these locations and avoid just straightforward detection by authorities if they so happened to become suspicious of him. Throughout 2007, a trio of kidnappings and murders would take place at the Boca Town Center Mall in Boca Raton, Florida. Witnesses who claim to have seen the suspect say that he was a tall, athletic man with long hair, and although he was wearing glasses and hoods and things to disguise himself, he really did match the description of Israel Keys. While he is a suspect, there is no direct evidence that he had anything to do with these murders, but... 
Of course, it takes money to travel around to all of these states, and while Israel did have his own construction business that he was doing well, it was not enough to fund all of these trips. It is estimated that Israel actually successfully burglarized about 20 to 30 homes all around the US, as well as robbed several banks. In April 2009, on one specific occasion, Israel did go to Tupper Lake, New York, where he did rob a bank, and after he was done, he went and parked in a nearby park parking lot where he watched emergency vehicles fly by on the way to the crime scene and he just kind of laughed to himself because I mean he was getting away with it he knew that they weren't gonna find him the following day a woman named Deborah Feldman went missing from her apartment in Hackensack New Jersey Israel has admitted taking a woman during his trip to New York but he denies ever knowing Deborah and when police presented him with a photo of her he just went absolutely blank and said I don't want to talk about that right now if you've heard of this case before, you may be familiar with Israel being known as the Kill Kit murderer, and I'm going to explain to you why he is called that. In addition to his methods of randomization, Israel would put together these giant buckets filled with everything he needed to commit and get away with the perfect crimes. Equipment in these buckets included things like weapons, ammo, rope, disguises, and even things like Drano in order to get rid of any evidence and any bodies that he may leave behind. He would then proceed to plant these kill kits all over the United States in case he just so happened to be visiting that state and he decided that he wanted to kill somebody. He already had these buckets pre-made and pre-planted so he could just drive a few miles, go pick him up, and do what he came there to do. June 8th of 2011 is actually believed to be one of the first times that Israel used one of these kill kits. Israel originally flew to Chicago where he would then rent a car and drive halfway across the country to Essex, Vermont. It was here that Israel would retrieve one of the kill kits that he had planted two years earlier and begin staking out a suburban neighborhood in search for his next victim. Covered from head to toe in a black disguise, Israel stumbled upon this certain house in a neighborhood who had no signs of children because there was no toys or play equipment equipment out in the yard and he saw no signs of the person having a pet such as a watchdog because there was no dog toys and he figured that this would be the perfect house to break into. Israel proceeded to creep around the perimeter of the house where he would cut the phone lines and break into this house's garage. He took a crowbar from the garage, broke in the window that led into the house and within five to six seconds he had found who lived in this house. He went in their bedrooms where he saw 55-year-old Lorraine Courier and her 50-year-old husband, Bill, who were asleep in their bed. Israel made sure that all of this happened really quickly in what he would describe a blitz-style attack because he wanted to catch this couple off guard when they were still waking up, disoriented and confused so that they would be more likely to follow his orders and less likely to fight back. He demanded that the couple roll onto their stomachs where he would zip tie their wrists and then he would begin packing some of their personal belongings in suitcases to buy some time and make it seem like the couple had just went on vacation if somebody were to come looking for them. 15 minutes later, Israel loaded Bill and Lorraine up into their own car and they would drive away from the home. Bill pleaded with Israel, saying that while he and his wife didn't have a lot of money to give him, Israel was welcome to take anything he could. He could take their wallets, their cash, their cars, and they wouldn't say a word if he just let them go right now. Israel just kind of of laughed at this and he told Bill not to worry because this was simply just a ransom kidnapping and that Israel would be handing them over to somebody else and that as long as you know money was paid they would all be fine. But it wasn't long until Israel was forcing Bill into the basement of an abandoned farmhouse on the outskirts of Essex. After tying Bill to a stool and returning upstairs to retrieve Lorraine, he noticed that she had managed to get out of the car and as soon as the two made eye contact, Lorraine sprinted as fast as she could away from the car. Unfortunately, Lorraine was not fast enough and Israel was able to catch up with her, tackling her to the ground and dragging her back into the farmhouse where he would take her upstairs and tie both her neck and her limbs to a mattress on the floor where he would proceed to sexually assault her. This whole time, Bill was thrashing around in the basement trying to break free and he was yelling, where is my wife? What are you doing to my wife? By the time Israel came back down to the basement, he saw that Bill had managed to break the stool into pieces, therefore loosening the ropes, 
And this sent Israel into an absolute rage. Israel states that since he planned his attacks so meticulously that when things didn't go according to the plan and people started trying to fight back, it just unleashed this uncontrollable rage that even surprised himself sometimes. Israel began beating Bill with a shovel, but even this wasn't enough and Bill continued to try and fight back in which at this point Israel grabbed a gun and shot Bill several times until he fell down and took his final breath. He then went upstairs to retrieve Lorraine and bring her back down to the basement to see what had happened to her husband. And then he would tie her wrists behind her back with both rope and zip ties and strangle her to death. Talk about an absolute house of horror. Horrors. With both couriers dead at this point, Israel realizes that this whole affair took a lot longer than he originally planned and the sun was starting to come up. He had planned on burning the house down with the bodies inside, but now that it was getting to be the early morning and people could potentially be driving by on their way to work, he knew that he had to do something differently. Israel decided to leave the bodies there in the basement. He knew that this house was very old and dilapidated and that if anybody were to end up buying it in the future, they would probably just, you know, crack the smell of death down to an animal dying in the basement and that they would just tear down the property in order to construct a new building on it anyways. So he poured Drano onto both of the bodies before putting them into separate big trash bags pushing them to the corner of the basement and covering their bodies with various piles of garbage that were just sitting in the basement. Unfortunately, Israel would end up being correct in his assumption about the courier's remains. The house was torn down less than a year later and basically bulldozed to a landfill. Israel's trip to Vermont had lasted less than six hours, but in this time he had managed to kill two people and get away with it scot-free. If Israel hadn't later confessed to this murder, police to this day would still have no idea what happened to Bill and Lorraine, and that's absolutely terrifying. The following year in in February of 2012, Israel would go on to claim his last known victim. Emphasis on known. On the night of February 1st, 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was working at the local coffee shop called Common Grounds in Anchorage, Alaska. She was a senior in high school and according to her co-workers, she was a very nice girl with a great personality who the regular customers absolutely loved. At this time, Samantha was living with her father James and her boyfriend Dwayne. The same night that Samantha was working the shift at Common Grounds, Israel Key was lurking around the local area with his police scanner, trying to pinpoint the area with the least amount of law enforcement activity. Despite being a pretty frequent and popular business, this coffee stand was actually hidden pretty well, especially considering the fact that it's February in Anchorage, Alaska, and there's a lot of snow. So snow plows had been clearing out the parking lot and pushing these big piles of snow around the perimeter, which kind of made a little barrier between the coffee stand and the very busy road and everything around it. This fact, combined with the surrounding businesses being closed due to it being nighttime and the fact that there wasn't a lot of police activity in the area, Israel decided that this was the perfect place to commit his next murder. So he parked his car out of CCTV view, approached the coffee stand, and ordered a coffee from Samantha Koenig. As Samantha turned around to hand Israel his drink, he was actually holding a revolver in his hand and told Samantha that this was a robbery. He immediately demanded that Samantha turn off all of the lights in the kiosk and kneel on the ground while he jumped through the window of common grounds. As most cashiers are taught, it's better to just hand over the money rather than putting your own life in jeopardy. So Samantha did exactly what Israel said. Despite being in complete shock, Samantha was able to remain calm, cool, and collected while Israel took the money from the register and put it in his bag. Now, at this point, Israel obviously isn't just going to let Samantha go because he wasn't really there for the money after all. He would take her out of the coffee stand and lead her back to his car where he told her to just act like they were a couple and that she had had a little too much to drink so that he was being a caring boyfriend leading her back to the car. And he threatened that if she made a a single noise trying to alert anybody to what was happening here, he would 
shoot her right then and there. Samantha was taken back to Israel's truck where she was tied up and the two would drive off into the night with everybody none the wiser as to what had just happened. On the way to their destination, which is unknown to Samantha at this point, Israel begins explaining that this is just a kidnapping for ransom. He assures her that if her family paid the amount of money he was going to demand that he would release her safe and sound. A few minutes into driving, Israel realizes that Samantha doesn't have her phone on her and that it got left behind at the coffee kiosk, which completely threw off his methodical plan to send a text message from her phone demanding the ransom from her family. He actually turns the car around, goes back to common grounds while Samantha is tied up in his car and he just leaves her there while he runs in to grab her phone. I'm sure some of you are wondering why she didn't take this opportunity to just get out of the truck and escape while Israel ran into the coffee kiosk, but you have to remember at this point that she's tied up and Israel is running in so fast that she likely does not have time to get away from him even if she tried to run. Israel did return only a few seconds after retrieving her phone and once again the two were off into the night. Samantha's boyfriend Dwayne had actually planned to pick her up after her shift that evening but once he arrived and saw that all of the lights in the kiosk were off and that she was nowhere to be found he decided he needed to check things out. So Dwayne goes into the kiosk and he notices that there's a lot of napkins all over the floor, cups are knocked over, and things just seem off. Dwayne, being a little young and perhaps naive, just assumes that maybe Samantha got a ride from another friend and just forgot to tell him, so he leaves. Shortly after, Israel would use Samantha's phone to text both Dwayne and her boss, saying that she just had a really bad day and she was going to go out of town for the weekend. He then removed the battery from Samantha's phone, leaving it untraceable. At this point, Israel asks Samantha where her debit card is so that when he demands this ransom, he can use the card to get money out of the ATM. But the problem is that Samantha says that she left her debit card in the truck that she shared with her boyfriend, which was at her house. Samantha gives Israel her address because after all, she really believes that if she cooperates, she can make it out of this alive. Israel then takes Samantha to his house, locks her up in a shed where he ties her up and turns up the radio in case she starts making any noises and he can just drown it out so that the neighbors don't hear. Keep in mind that Israel's girlfriend and 10 years year old daughter are just feet away from the shed in their house with no idea what's going on right in their own backyard. After telling Samantha that he has a police scanner and he will know if she tries to escape, Israel then leaves Samantha in the shed and goes to her house where her father and boyfriend are staying. Israel manages to get the debit card out of the truck, but Dwayne does see this happening and he comes outside asking, what are you doing? And Dwayne turns around inside to go get help from Samantha's father. But during this time, Israel managed to escape and get away with it yet again. Insane. It's truly insane to me just how close Israel was getting both to returning to the crime scene and then going to her house where her loved ones are. He even got caught at one point, but he still ended up getting away with it. I cannot imagine how her father and boyfriend must feel knowing that Israel had this much confidence to just do all of these things and get that close to them after knowing what he's doing to this girl. Once Israel got back to the shed, he would pour himself a glass of wine and inform Samantha that he was going to repeatedly sexually assault her and strangle her to death. Horribly enough, that's exactly what Israel did. And afterwards, he would stroll right back into his house, which was only a few feet away, and begin packing because the following morning, he had a family vacation to go on with his girlfriend and 10-year-old daughter. The manner in which Israel is able to compartmentalize these horrible, heinous, violent actions that he's committing, and then just as quickly turn around, flip a switch, and act like a completely normal human being is completely insane and beyond me. A lot of people who knew Israel in his adulthood claim that they saw absolutely no red flags and they could not believe that he ended up being a serial killer, but it really makes you wonder if there were signs and perhaps they were just written off as quirks because... He just must be really good at acting or people are just turning a blind eye because that is 
The next morning, as Israel and his family were preparing to go to the airport and fly to New Orleans to get on a cruise, the morning shift employee at the Common Grounds was coming into the kiosk to clock in. But it wasn't long until she noticed all of the disarray and mess, the napkins and the cups being knocked over. And she also noticed that all of the money was gone from the cash register. She then informed her boss of the shop's condition, who immediately went to the security cameras and saw everything that had taken place that previous night. The boss, of course, sees Samantha being abducted at the end of her shift and immediately contacts police. As news of Samantha's disappearance spread, members of the community along with police would begin to draw their own conclusions about who had done this to Samantha. It's not unusual for the people closest to the victim to be immediate suspects because that is typically true in these cases, but unfortunately, Samantha's own father, James, would become the target for a lot of blame and hatred throughout the community. James had had a bit of a rough past and he was friends with people who who had been to jail before, who had done drugs, and unfortunately, this would really work against him. A rumor started throughout the community that James owed somebody a lot of money for drugs and that this person had probably come and abducted Samantha in order to get their money back. And James was really just horrified that he was being blamed for this and he would never do anything to hurt his daughter, so this really hurt his heart. As the police began speaking to James as if he were undoubtedly guilty, this really offended James and he stopped wanting to talk with police and cooperate with them, which of course made them even more suspicious. Two weeks after Samantha's death, Israel returned from his family vacation to Dallas, Texas. And once again, without skipping a beat, freshly relaxed and revitalized from his cruise vacation with his family, Israel continued his crime spree in Texas. He robbed two banks, he burglarized a home before burning it down, and around the very same time, a man named Jimmy Tidwell, who lived in the area, went missing from his cabin. A week later, on February 18th, Israel returned to his home in Anchorage, where he would start writing a typewritten ransom note demanding $30,000 from Samantha's family in exchange for her safe return. He requested that this $30,000 be put in Samantha's bank account so that he could use her debit card to withdraw the money from ATMs. And it didn't stop there. I just want to give you a little heads up that this next part is extremely disturbing. It, probably the most disturbing thing out of this entire case and maybe even any true crime case ever because I don't think I've heard of any other serial killer doing such a thing. Just, just a disclaimer warning right here. You're about to hear something real messed up. Israel returned to the shed in his backyard where Samantha's remains had been decomposing for two weeks and he started putting makeup on her, braiding her hair, and going as far as sewing her eyelids open with fishing line to make it appear as if she were alive. He then took a Polaroid photo of her propped up against the wall while he simultaneously held up the most recent edition of the Anchorage newspaper in order to show the date. He used this photo to make it appear as if Samantha were still alive and well so that her family would willingly send over this $30,000. Little did her family know that this picture that ended up giving them hope that their loved one was still alive was actually actually just her dead rotting body altered to make it look like it was alive like is that not so messed up how do you even think to do that so israel plants this ransom note along with the polaroid and then uses samantha's phone to text her boyfriend Dwayne and tell him to go check the bulletin board at the local park anchorage police were immediately notified of this text and went straight to the park to recover the note and photo when the community saw samantha's father james scrambling to get all of this money put together in order to hand over the ransom and get his daughter back safe and sound they thankfully put some of their preconceived notions aside and they all came together to generously donate money to go towards the ransom. Meanwhile, Israel dismembered Samantha's body in his shed and then drove to the nearby Matanuska Lake where he cut a hole in the iced over surface of the lake and dumped her remains. He then burned all of her belongings. Only a few hours after James deposited this $30,000 into Samantha's bank account as he'd been instructed, 
police were notified that her debit card had some activity at a nearby ATM. So they rush over to this ATM where the withdrawal had taken place to look at the footage and they see a man with a completely black disguise and they see him taking money out with this card and then he just takes it and gets in his car and leaves. Police were a lot more hopeful at this point in the case than they'd ever been before because although they couldn't identify this man due to his disguise and he was long gone from the ATM, they felt that now that he had the money he demanded, maybe he would finally let Samantha go and she could be returned home safely. But things weren't quite so simple. As you probably know, you can't just go up to an ATM and request $30,000 to be deposited all at once. Israel and his white Ford Focus started appearing on ATM footage all over the country. It started in Alaska, went down to Arizona, then to New Mexico, and then to Texas. Police were able to keep track of his whereabouts throughout this ATM footage, but they were always just a few steps behind. They couldn't get ahead or caught up enough to actually catch him. As soon as he withdrew money from one one location, he was on to the next, and he was so random with these locations, as he intended purposefully, that police couldn't catch him. And since they didn't know his identity, they didn't know what he looked like since he was always wearing a disguise, they really only had his make and model of his white Ford Focus to put out to the public and go off of. One thing I found surprising about this whole thing is that Israel put so much meticulous planning into every single thing that he did. He was getting away with countless murders. He was getting away with all of these bank robberies, which I never thought happened. Like I did not know that you could successfully get away with a bank robbery if it wasn't happening in like some sort of action movie. But Israel was doing it somehow. Israel's doing all of this planning. He's getting away with things. He's being the successful serial killer that he wants to be. And yet he continues to drive this same white Ford Focus throughout the country knowing that the police have seen it and knowing that they're looking for him. So, you know, it would be seemingly pretty easy for him to just get a different car, a new car, and continue on his way uh, with a lot less likelihood of being caught, but instead he just keeps using the same vehicle. I don't know what his reasoning for this was, if he was just getting overconfident and thought even though they knew what car he was driving that they wouldn't catch him, or maybe he finally realized that his sixth sense for knowing who wouldn't be missed was actually off because a lot of people were looking for Samantha. Maybe he just thought, you know, I'm gonna get caught anyways, so what's the point? With that, on March 12th, 2012, a Texas Highway Patrolman sees a white Ford Focus in a parking lot in Lufkin, Texas. He knows that it's probably a long shot, but he just wants to wait and see who gets in this vehicle, so maybe he can do a little bit more digging on the situation. After following this vehicle from a distance for a while, he waits until it exceeds the speed limit by three miles per hour so that he can have a reasonable call to pull this vehicle over and see who the driver is. When obtaining the driver's information, this police officer of course finds out that this is Israel Keys, who just so happens to be from Alaska. Of course the odds of an Alaskan driving a white Ford Focus in Texas and not having anything to do with Samantha's disappearance are pretty slim to none, so the officer goes ahead and asks Israel to step out of the car. At first, Israel was extremely calm, stating that he was just visiting the area in order to see his family. As more and more police officers start to pull up to the scene and surround the area, Israel completely feigns ignorance and asks what all of this is about. Officers straight up tell Israel that they're investigating a kidnapping that took place in Israel's hometown, and Israel is like, what kidnapping? I don't know what you're talking about. Police are pretty sure it's no coincidence that Israel is driving around very close to the last location where money was taken out of Samantha's account and he's driving the same car. When searching Israel's vehicle, they would not only find the exact same disguises that they saw time and time again on this ATM footage, but they saw Samantha's debit card. With this, there's absolutely no doubt that Israel Keys is the perpetrator 
perpetrator responsible for Samantha Koenig's kidnapping, and he would immediately be extradited back to Alaska and admitted into the Anchorage Correctional Complex. At the same time, a SWAT team was sent out to Israel's home in efforts to look at the shed, look at his home, and see if there was any evidence of Samantha still being there, because at this point, they think that she may possibly still be alive. Unfortunately, as we all know, they would find no evidence of Samantha or her belongings in the shed or the home. Back at the correctional facility, police begin bribing Israel with coffee and snacks, hoping that they can get on his good side and he will fess up to the things that he's done. While Israel does agree to speak with him, he makes it very clear that this questioning is going to go the way that he wants it to go. He's going to say what he wants to say when he wants to say it and basically that's that. Israel pretty quickly admits that he murdered Samantha Koenig and dumped her body into a frozen lake so there's really no point in continuing to look for her alive at least. I really feel so bad for her family because I cannot imagine how they must have felt finding out that Samantha had been murdered after all of this time. He had dangled her well-being on a string in front of them and said if you just do this I'll give her back to you if you just give me money I'll give her back to you and turns out she wasn't even alive they thought that if they did everything right they would finally have Samantha back but that wasn't the case obviously they had held out hope for weeks and now all of a sudden just like that all of the hope was ripped out from under them and they were absolutely devastated the ease with which Israel admitted to committing this crime was really off-putting to investigators and it made them think that he had probably done something like this before. He was cool as a cucumber talking about the things that he did to Samantha, just like stating it matter-of-factly as if he was discussing mundane events like the weather or what he had for breakfast that day. At times, he would even laugh when he talked about the things that he did to Samantha. Man, I really wish I hadn't created all this drama. <laughs> When FBI flat out asked Israel if he was responsible for any other killings, he said that he would tell them more information on two conditions. One, he wanted the death penalty by lethal injection rather than life in prison. And two, he wanted his name kept out of the public eye. Israel didn't want to be the next infamous serial killer. And in fact, he wanted no attention at all out of fear that his actions would affect his daughter's future in a negative way. You know, I don't plan on being around a whole lot longer but a really big concern to me is, um, you know, my kid's going to be around. I don't want her to, like, type my name in the computer and have it pop up, like, and you know what probably has a pretty negative effect on your daughter's future, Israel? Probably the fact that you're a serial killer and you probably should have thought of that before you went on to do these horrible, terrible, heinous things. Israel even made a comment that he didn't want people to know about this because he didn't want to be associated with some true crime BS. Oopsies. Anywho, the FBI obviously had no say when it came down to what Israel would be charged with or what his sentencing would be, but they wanted to make him believe that they had some sort of control over that so they agreed to do the best that they could provided that he give them more information. So over the next seven months Israel would slowly begin to reveal parts of information and emphasis on the sum because as I mentioned before there are several instances of disappearance which are believed to have been done by Israel but that he never admitted to and that there's no evidence to directly relate him to these crimes so nobody can really be for sure. He told the investigators about his upbringing, how he was outcasted due to his cruelty to animals, and how he had abducted that one girl on the river in Oregon but had let her go. Two of his victims that he would end up identifying, however, were Bill and the Rain Courier from Essex, Vermont. Unfortunately, shortly after this revelation, a news source in Essex would release Israel's name in relation to the Courier's murders, and this really upset Israel because he had made this plan with the FBI that if he spoke, his name wouldn't be out there. So in his eyes, the FBI broke their end of the deal and he didn't want to speak to them anymore. Authorities were crushed when they learned that this article came out because they had been working for months to build rapport and build trust with Israel and he was just starting to reveal the identities of some of the people that he had killed. But now that this article came out, 
he shut down. He was not going to divulge any more useful information. Israel would occasionally give small hints in relation to the crimes that he had committed, but not enough for police to be able to do anything with it. It was almost like Israel was just teasing them with what they could have had had they held up their end of this deal that they had made. I don't want to put a bunch of blame on this news outlet in Vermont because I'm sure they had no clue what would end up happening when they released this article, but they kind of ended inadvertently caused so many disappearances and murders to go unsolved by releasing Israel's name and I'm sure they just look back and kick themselves but as I've said before hindsight is 2020 and it's just really unfortunate that Israel was so power hungry that if things didn't go his way then he doesn't care if people get closure when it comes to their loved ones that they've never seen again. So while he's not really speaking to police, Israel begins to be known as a very difficult inmate. So while Israel kind of shut up when it came to the crimes that he committed, he started to be known as a really difficult inmate. He would go to court appearances, he would try to run away from the courtroom, and he would also try to pick the locks on his handcuffs, so authorities really had to keep an eye on him. Fortunately, he would never be successful in his attempts to escape. Okay, ooh, I'm a bad guy. I tried to escape, but um, let's be honest. Nobody really thought I was a good guy before that, so... <laughs> In July, Israel was found to have constructed sort of a makeshift noose in his cell, which caused authorities to move him to a sort of maximum security cell where he didn't have things like bed sheets where he could potentially take his own life. He was on suicide watch, basically. Eventually, after a few months, it was determined that Israel was no longer a threat to himself and he was returned to a standard cell. But on the morning of December 2nd, 2012, correctional officers found Israel Keys deceased in his cell due to suicide at the age of 34 the night prior by insanguination and self-strangulation. The correctional officer on duty this night actually ended up getting fired because it turns out that while Israel was committing suicide, this correctional officer was sort of just sitting at his desk, surfing the internet, talking with his co-workers, reading a book, and when he did go on rounds like he was supposed to, he didn't look far enough into Israel's cell to see that he was literally laying there in a pile of his own blood dead. This correctional officer actually ended up taking legal action against the facility because he said that while he admits he was not doing his job the way that he should be, he said that all of the other night shift officers did the same thing where they would just get on the internet, talk on the phone, and they never had repercussions for their actions, so why was he now getting fired? Like, which to that I just have to say, okay and like if your friends are jumping off a cliff are you gonna go jump off the cliff no you're not you should be doing your job that you're getting paid for. So after Israel's body was removed from his cell, they found several pieces of yellow bloody paper underneath his body, which would be a suicide note and some very interesting drawings that he had made. They hoped that Israel's suicide note would contain more information about the crimes that he had committed, but unfortunately, Israel kept his word when he said he was not telling them anything else, and he had written more of like a poem-like suicide note which had more to do with how he disliked America and how he was smarter and better than everybody else. I will leave a link down below to Israel's entire little poem that he wrote but one little part that he included says, watch close while I work now, feel the electric shock of my touch, open my trembling flower or your petals I'll crush. So as you can see there's nothing really productive going on in here, he just kind of felt the need to get his artistic self out there before he so along with this note israel did another little art project where he drew 11 skulls with his own blood and it's believed that these 11 skulls were his admission to killing 11 people but seeing as he went all over the country and people just so happened to be disappearing wherever he went it's likely that he took the lives of many many more than just 11. unfortunately we will never be too sure what the truth of the matter is and the families 
of Israel's victims will likely never get closure. With that, we've just about come to the end of today's video, and this whole case really just made my skin crawl in the fact that Israel could be such a normal, functioning human being in society while simultaneously going around and committing these horrible acts. And just everybody in his community was none the wiser. He just seemed like a great father and partner. But in reality, you just never know, I guess. That's horrible. Horrible. It's clear that even after he was caught and even after his death, that Israel only had himself in mind. He was playing mind games with the police. His suicide note was just about himself. I have no words. I really just don't even know what else to say. There are so many people out there who lost their loved ones at the hands of Israel Keys, and now they just have to live out the rest of their lives without ever getting any type of closure. I'd love for you guys to share your thoughts and opinions down below in the comments and maybe even start a bit of a conversation. Do you really believe that Israel only claimed the lives of 11 people? Why do you think he became so reckless in the aftermath of Samantha's abduction? If you made it this far, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to sit down and talk some true crime with me. There were so many nice comments on my previous video that I was not expecting and I just want to tell you how much it truly warmed my heart that there are people out there like watching me and enjoying my content and it's just like a whole feeling I can't describe but I just want to let you know that I appreciate you so much. I've only recently started making these videos, but true crime is something that I've been into pretty heavily for about the past eight years, and it's something that I would be doing regardless if I was making videos about it or not. But the fact that I can sit down and spread awareness with you guys while you are enjoying my content just truly means the world to me. So again, thank you so much, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!